First of all, I would like to introduce our um, guest presenter today. Uh, Kim Lam Lambert is enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians located in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, she had been the executive director of the Cherokee Tribal Vocational Rehabilitation Service Project since 2008 and also the Executive Director of Vocational Opportunities of Cherokee since 2005. And prior to that, she worked for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians for 22 years, um, started out, I think, as a secretary all those years ago, and uh, worked her way up to Executive Director. So, um, Kim, we appreciate you joining us today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience as a director. Um, also wanted to mention that Kim was a previous officer with KNR. Um, she's taught a lot of workshops on tribal VR, job training. Um, she has three children, John, Jordan, and her youngest, Jessica, who just graduated and now is Dr. Jessica Lambert. Um, congratulations to her, Kim, uh, and just want to let everyone know that Kim just retired, I think, in, was it in August? Mm -hmm, yes. Yeah. After 40 years of service to her tribe and her community and her people. So thank you for joining us, Kim. We certainly appreciate it. Um, thank you. Also, I wanted to, um, first of all, I'd like to welcome our director at AverTAC, Wayne Daigle, is with us today, and also Dr. Lee Gashioma, uh, previous director at AverTAC. So thank you both for joining us today. Um, but I'd also like to introduce someone new to you all, um, the, our new community programs coordinator at the Institute for Human Development and at AverTAC. Mr. Earlson Peacock is from the Northern region of the Navajo Nation, and he joins us with a tremendous amount of experience from Native American grants coordination and development. Earlson has been a STEM teacher, I believe at Kayana Middle School. Uh, I believe he was also a coach as well at Monument Valley High School. Um, Earlson has been a grants coordinator with Navajo Nation's Tuba City Regional Healthcare, as well as a grants analyst uh, with the same agency. He completed his degree from Northern Arizona University in occupational education. And so he brings to AverTAC a real wealth of information and experience in and among our Native communities. So I'm pleased to introduce to you all Mr. Earlson Peacock. Um, and he will be joining us periodically during our webinars and our other professional development opportunities to provide insight and oversight to our training programs at AverTech. So with that, I would like to ask Earlson if he has anything to add or anything else he would like to say, and also to start us off in a good way this morning with a prayer. Good morning. Thank you, Jamie. I think you covered everything. Forgot I was a basketball coach, so <laughs> um, it's good times. Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jamie, uh, Lee, and my supervisor Wayne Daigle. Um, so we're just um, hap I'm happy to be here. I'm very blessed to be here, and really thankful uh, to move on to this new chapter in our life. And um, I'm just really happy to be here. Very humbled. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and just open up in prayer. Um, today and get our meeting started. And thank you again, Jamie, for introduction and hosting um, my webinar. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for another day. Uh, we thank you for all that you have done, you have are doing and yet to do. I come to name, I come to you, Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, we welcome you uh, in our midst today, and we celebrate the life that you have graced upon us, each and every one of us today. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice, that open our minds, that we may receive your wisdom, and open our spirits and our hearts so that we may know your leading, your guidance. Lord, I just pray for every person present today that you would quicken their hearts and their minds today, and that you would give them wisdom to lead and direct and guide um, them in their respective locations. 
And we just put everything in your hands in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much, Earlson. Let me see if I can share this PowerPoint correctly. Is that in presenter mode or do you all see the same screen I do? We're seeing the same one you do. We see the- Okay, let me see if I can get it in presenter mode. All right. How about that? Everyone see that? Yep. There you go. Perfect. So today we're going to just talk a little bit about um, our Avers Projects uh, grants and the financial setup for new grants and also a little bit about fiscal management. And so we asked Kim to join us today because she does have all these years of experience as a director and um, she has told me uh, before that she really likes talking about the finance part of our projects. So thank you again, Kim, for joining us. Let me switch real quick. I wanna just share with you that we're hoping today to um, include some learning outcomes about the information we're sharing with you. We're wanting to increase um, awareness about, you know, basic general practices that strengthen your internal controls um, and also talk about meeting your match um, and cost share requirements, um, increasing your knowledge about the um, wonderful resource that is available to you called the TVR Institute's Financial Management Toolkit. And also um, we're hoping to increase understanding just about basic grant management, including your grant cycles, your cost principles. And also we're gonna talk a little bit about the OMB, which is the Office of Management and Budgets Uniform Guidance. So let's go back. I think Miles has a poll for us. So what is fiscal management? Is it A, the process of expenditures, um, the process of directing activities, controlling the spending, or maintaining uh, responsibility of the grant? Or is it all of the way above? We'll give everybody a minute or two to think about that. Well, maybe not that long, maybe half a minute. Okay, I think we got 100% here. So it looks like, Miles, can you share the, the results of the poll? So it looks like everyone's pretty much on the right track. We're gonna say all of the above and you're correct because um, fiscal management is basically all of those things that we just mentioned in the poll. Uh, it's the planning, the directing, the controlling of the finances and the resources, the management and the responsibility, um, expenditures, everything that goes along with managing your grant funds. Kim, you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, it's very complicated, <laughs> but we're going to try to help you break it down a little bit. Um, as you do this and um, as the years go by and the months, you get more of the hang of it. 
Um, it seems really complicated in the very beginning, but the, the more you do things and, and you get your policies and procedures and everything set in place, then it just all kind of falls into place. And as we go along, we're going to talk some more about um, how you budget your costs and how you budget what you spend on your clients or your consumers and kind of break it down a little bit more. And we encourage everybody to share stories with us because I feel like a lot, that's how we learn is it, when we share what we've done and what we haven't done. And um, I just, I, I want this to be kind of casual and people um, will feel free to share their stories. Thank you, Kim. So let's talk about um, your budget and your grant, because a lot of people that that that's the questions we get at Avertac is a lot about uh, can I spend money on this? Can I buy that? Can I include this in the IPE services? So when you have questions like that, we recommend that you go to your grant and actually look and see what the content of your grant is. So when you're addressing things like expenditures. Um, it's important to go to the abstract. You know, you want to look at um, the proposed number of individuals that you're going to serve in each um, budget period. Also, um, your employment outcomes that you should be achieving for each of your budget periods. And this is going to kind of help you in the direction of the expenditures of your grant. Um, and then the other section that is important, important is that quality of management plan. Um, so you're talking about, you know, achieving your goals and objectives in that grant. And how do you do that? And how are you going to use your funds to do that? So we like to talk about, you know, having um, a budget proposal, um, a budget projection, um, and having it be on time and within your budget um, areas, uh, you know, everything that you've included in that budget is clearly defined. So like the responsibilities of your staff, um, timelines, milestones, things like that, that you are attempting to achieve with those funds. Um, also, other areas are the ED524. Um, form your budget narrative, and then also um, your application when you submitted that. And I think, Kim, you were going to share a little bit more on this area. Uh, yeah, just like, the, like she said, it all goes back to what you put in your grant. Um, if you know the number of individuals that you're going to serve and you know how much money that your grant is, it should be broken down into separate categories. So you'll know how much money you can spend for staff. You know what? And then you figure out, you know, you should already have the job descriptions and, and it, most tribes have a pay scale. So you'll know where that person falls on the pay scale. So all that's pretty much. Uh, outlined in your, you know, of your staffing. Then you go on to what you can spend on the consumers. You you know, in your grant budget will tell you what you can spend for um, your supplies and on all of those individual things. And as we go on more, we're going to talk about how you're going to account for all of that stuff and how you're going to plan to have it all, you know, be able to do all the things that you need to do under the amount of money that you received. Thanks so much, Kim. Um, so show of hands, does everyone know what their budget is and have they completed um, their outline? Do they know what areas they're going to spend in? My hand's up and I didn't mean to put it up, but I, I guess because I have AI on my computer now. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone else? Do we have some new directors on here that may not be that familiar? I see Sheila's hands up. Gail has her hand up. So yeah, for the most part, if you've been a director for a while, you you pretty much know this. And this is just a recap. I see Janine, Ramona. Um, a lot of folks have their hands up. Jamie, you got questions, responses in the chat box as well. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we have some new directors on here. A lot of folks. 
Oh, and Elena, I just want to say real quick. Um, yes, this presentation is recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel afterwards. And you should have received materials, the supporting materials uh, for this webinar before we started this morning. So if you didn't get that email with today's materials, just send me an email. I'll put my email address in the chat. And uh, we can make sure you get those supporting materials. So yeah, um, Rosa is a new director. Thank you for joining us, Rosa. Hopefully this will be some helpful information for you, where to go look in your grant um, as far as your budget and where your expenditures are gonna be for the most part. So let's talk about key areas um, for your APR. Everyone know what APR means? Let's see, the first hand up was Ramona. Ramona, could you tell the group today, what does APR mean? APR, what does it mean? Yeah. Approve. I didn't raise my hand. It's automatically raised. <laughs> that happened to me too, Ramona. <laughs> I was waving my hand in the screen and it made my Isn't it annual performance report. Yes, uh, that's right. It is. That okay. was a question. I'm sorry, Ramona. I didn't think about it. Put me on the spot. You know, we use a lot of acronyms in AVERS and then um you know, sometimes folks that aren't as familiar with what we do, they'll say, what does that stand for? What's that acronym? And so I was just looking at the presentation and thinking, um, there may be folks on here today that don't even know what that acronym means. But yes, it's the annual performance report. And so the key areas to consider about your budget in your APR are the number of um, individuals you're serving, um, what services you're providing, any educational services, you're reporting your employment outcomes. Um, also, if you have any interaction with other state um, agencies, uh, a state VR agency, or any other type of um, agency that you may be working with, you're also reporting on um, the evaluation, your self-evaluation of your program, and then also your participant satisfaction. And uh, Kim, could you share with us a little bit about what the APR looks like and, and what those key areas look like when you're reporting? Um, there's a lot of questions on there. And so it's very imperative that you keep really good documentation about all the, you're definitely all, want to record all your outcomes of these different areas. And one key component um, component to the APR is the director's uh, letter and I always use my director's letter to out to um, emphasize people that have had great outcomes because the people that read this I want them to consider that how important this funding is to Indian country and how important it is that we're able to serve these these consumers that would not be able to be served from anybody else. So, in, in, you know, all, it's very important to keep up with all these outcomes, but it's also important to emphasize the good, the good things that we're doing in our community. I just wanted to throw that out there. And I know there's um, a meeting tomorrow um, and RSA is going to go over the um, new things that they have in the APR for this year. So um, hopefully everybody has received that um, that link for that meeting tomorrow. Thank you so much for mentioning that, um, Kim, because I think there might have been some confusion. I think a lot of people thought that today's webinar might have something to do with that RSA call tomorrow. And um we had to send out an email to some folks saying, no, that's separate from us. RSA is completely separate. We're not connected directly with them. Um, they hold their own uh, trainings and, and calls. So that tomorrow, I believe Wayne sent a, um, 
notice out yesterday about that meeting. And so, yeah, folks so were um, I'll jump in real quick and, and take just a few sure. minutes. Uh, that, that RSA training will occur tomorrow. The directors uh, should have received the invite today. We sent it out again this morning. If you have not, as a director, received that, please email me directly and I'll get you the link and all of the materials. So it's important that you you look at the email that we sent out and, and print off the materials because RSA has provided us all, um, all, all copies of what they're going to be going over and it'll be what you're working on in the training tomorrow. We will be recording that training as well and it will also be posted on our YouTube channel and um, on our website as a future resource for the APR um, to, to fill it out. Thank you so much, Wayne, for letting folks know where that resource will be and where they can uh, register if they need to. Um, I want to go back real quick. Amanda had put um, something in the chat earlier that said, you know, she hopes that the Canehar Town Hall grant writing um, is held this time around because it's always a good place um, for folks to share ideas. And we're not involved in that grant writing um, presentation. It is held by KNR. So yeah, I believe there will be, I don't know for sure. I know there was um, a grant writing session at the um, mid-year, I believe, or what, no, I'm sorry, it was last annual. So I feel like they hold it during the annual meeting at KNR. So that probably will be held, I'm not for sure. Whenever their agenda comes out, you can check and see. But anyway, moving on, um, those key areas for your APR, make sure that you focus on them uh, because that'll be very helpful for not only your project, but also for your project officer. Moving on, we're going to talk about reviewing your grant budget. So there's some terms here that we felt like that we needed to talk about. Um, the match, the indirect cost, and what is fund accounting. Um, so the match is pretty much the 10% match amount that's calculated from your total project cost, and that includes the match amount. Um, that's not the amount of the federal funds alone. The indirect costs are costs that are related to the use of the tribe, or the tribal organizations, facilities, offices, um, any administrative support, their telephone systems sometimes, um, you know, if you use their building, um, those are considered indirect costs. So um, facility costs are related to, you know, like your office, your meeting spaces, utilities, operations, any maintenance for your, your um, building. Uh -oh. I didn't mean to move forward. I got distracted because I remember a story that um, Kim told me one time about maintenance costs. <laughs> and uh, she might share that with us today. So Kim, do you, you want to talk a little about, about what match is, what indirect cost is, and then also about fund accounting? Um, we are very fortunate that our, our tribe is a gaming tribe and we have a lot of resources. So I went to tribal council and just asked for a cash match. So they awarded us a cash match. And so we, they give us that money and we incorporate that into our budget. And then we, that, that just gives us that much extra money um, to spend. Um, indirect costs is usually a percentage of what they take off the top. Um, I've heard of people having, you know, 10% indirect all the way up to 35% indirect costs. And it's off of our, the way ours was calculated is off of our salaries. And so we're able to use those indirect costs, you know, like you said, to have the meeting space, um, just maintenance and that kind of thing um, that's part of the tribe. Um, fund accounting is a is um, our finance office has about 80 people working there. Um, like I said, we're a gaming tribe. And so we have um, accountants in there that are like assigned to our program and they have a huge financial software system. And so um, it's very sophisticated, thank goodness. So it's able, they're able to give us a lot of information. Um, 
but we just need to make sure that if you're a new director or you're getting ready to write a grant that your you know your finance office has an accounting system that you know an audit comes off of that that goes to the the federal government and they need to make sure that you know everything's accounted for and then when we go on further with this we're going to talk about how you will have your own accounting system in your office so you can track your expenditures and make sure that they match what the finance office says that you're spending because that all relates to your drawdowns but we'll talk about that as we go forward Yes, thank you so much, Kim. Um, moving forward, let's talk a little bit more about the difference between match and cost sharing and in-kind. So cost sharing um, is required um, by uh, the Section 121A of the Rehab Act, and the regulation that uh, pertains to that is 371.40, um, and that's at the 10% of the total cost of your project. So that is what we call match or cost sharing. Um, and at the OMB level, uh, 200.29, cost sharing or matching means the portion of the project's cost not paid by federal funds unless otherwise authorized by the federal statute. And then when we are discussing in kind, that also refers to the definition in the OMB, which is 200.96. And this is third-party in-kind contribution. So that means uh, contributions um, of the value of non-cash contributions, for example, property or services, um, and that they have to either A, benefit the federally assisted project or program, and B, are contributed by a non-federal third party without charge. So those are like the formal definitions of those two. Um, and they come from the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB. So right now, I think we have another poll we're gonna put up. And this poll says, what is financial tracking? So is it, you know, once the bu budget's established, um, is it like a bank account? Is it a comprehensive system that includes all your reports? Or could it be all of the above? Okay, I think that we've got the majority of our answers. And so you're right. Uh, Miles, can you share the results? Uh, for the most part, um, it is all of the above. It is all of these areas. Um, any of these answers can be correct, and all of them are correct. So let's talk a little bit about setting up your financial tracking. Um, so once your, bu your budget is established, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're tracking all your expenditures, um, it's specifically line items. Uh, so it's like a bank account. Uh, you know, it's a report, a system of reporting your expenditures, um, any reports that come from your finance office, I refer to them as the bank. <laughs> Um, I don't know if other people think of them like that, but I do. Uh, and the tracking that's done, you know, at your level, at the program level, is kind of like the, the check register, right? So you're tracking all of the expenditures when you've written a check um, and reducing your budget amount by those amounts. Um, so reports from your accounting department, um, you know, those are things that help you kind of stay on track. And as Kim mentioned earlier, your drawdowns and spend downs and things like that, um, you're able to access those reports through your tribal accounting system. Um, and so those reports really should include um, like an itemization of your current expenditures, 
Um, also, the total amount the tribe has drawn down from RSA against your grant award amount. Um, and that's what we, when we're saying drawdown, that's what we're talking about. Um, but you should have a report from your, your uh, finance office uh, with those amounts on it. And also that report, um, you know, it reports all the funds that are encumbered. You know, they may be allocated, but not yet spent. So if you've encumbered amounts, those should also be included in your finance office reports. Um, and usually this includes, you know, a log of like any purchase orders that you've already issued, but the funds have not come out yet, that type thing. And this is where we want to start talking about um, cuff accounts. And Kim, I'd like for you to share a little more with us today what a cuff account is and how that works. Okay, the way we set up our cuff accounts is we used our grant budget and we set it up that way because a lot of that has um, all your individual things inside your grant budget that you would document like how much you spend for supplies, how much you spend on consumers, how much you spend on equipment. So we set up our cuff accounts to match that. And then that's how we take our grant amount that's in our budget. And that's how we utilize it for our cuff account. So if we have supplies and we have $5,000, then that's our beginning budget for our supplies. And then we do, every time we do a purchase order, it gets deducted from that. And that always gives you a run in total. So you know how much you have left to spend. And sometimes you can also set that up if you want to have um, things that you want to meet where you want to say quarterly, I'm only going to spend a fourth of that amount. And then the next quarter I'll spend another, you know, a, another a fourth. So if you want to set it up like that, you can, but it's imperative that you have these really good cuff accounts and they, that you have somebody that can monitor that because um, you don't want to ever get in the negative of anything. And you also need to track how much you've spent. So you know how much more you need to spend, you know, by a certain amount of time. So oh, our cuff accounts have run in totals for every one of the line items to sh ensure that they stay within our approved budget. Thank you so much, Kim. Does anybody have any questions about cuff accounts? I think for the most part, especially the directors that are on here or individuals that are um, very um, involved in the budget portion of the grant are familiar with cuff accounts, but we wanted to share with you, you know, what that means. Um, Pat says, do we need RSA approval? Do you mean for... I'm sorry, somebody was talking. Do you mean, do you need approval to set up a cup account? Yes. That's what I was wondering. Do we need uh, to have RSA approved that we would set up a cup account for the program? Go ahead, Kim. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> uh, no, that's an internal thing. That's that's how you keep up with your your expenses. And uh, RSA is only concerned with uh, making sure that you draw down your money on time and that it's spent for the you know what you say you're going to spend it for in your grant. Thank you, Pat, for that question, and thank you, thanks, Kim, for explaining that. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk a little more about. Um, financial tracking. So, you know, you should have like a, a system. Uh, most um, TVR projects have some sort of software uh, that they use, but if you don't, it's okay. Some programs uh, keep everything, you know, manually on their computer with spreadsheets and Excel and things like that. But, you know, it's really important that you kind of have this confidential code system for your participants' names so that you can um, identify expenditures, where they went, which cases they went to, um, in order, first of all, to protect the identity of the participants. Um, and, you know, that's the most important is that confidentiality. Um, but you also want to keep track of expenses and, and track where those expenditures went to or were going to. 
Um, and then also another thing that you need to track when you, we're talking about financial tracking is your inventory management. So, um, you know, a lot of folks purchase equipment, you know, tools, books, other supplies that are related to the IPE, you know, the work or the training that's involved um, with the employment goals. So it's important that you have a system in place to track these items as well that you have spent funds on. Um, sometimes you have a loan program where you loan um, tools or supplies to participants, um, you know, during the activities with the project. And also, um, when you're tracking these items, you know, you're keeping track of what the expenses were. So once that budget, you know, is established, you're tracking your expenditures um, against individual light items, you know, like your bank account, you're keeping, you know, a system of, you know, reports so that you know where the funds went um, and that that tracking is done on the program level. You know, like we talked about earlier, your check register, you know, your bank account information. Um, so, you know, when you're talking about all of these different types of financial tracking, it's really you're just kind of trying to keep track of where you've spent your funds. Kim, you need to add to that? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Just just keep track of everything, basically, on a spreadsheet if you can. And, you know, that way you kind of know who has what. And, you know, if you need to recover something or that people need to bring something back. Um, we, we find that um, it's kind of sometimes it's really hard to get people to bring the stuff back. So just make sure you've got some kind of policy as to what you're going to do going forward when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we cover that in some of our other trainings, too, when we talk about the IPE and your loan program and how you um, have individuals responsible for items that they receive through your loan program. But as far as the expenditures for those items purchased, you do need a way of tracking that. And I just wanted to mention that um, we use the TVR Institute's Financial Handbook um, for most of this presentation. So we're basically going by uh, the outline in that um, financial handbook. So if you go to our website, um, go to the TVR Institute's page on the AverTech website, and there is a link to that financial um, institute or the TVR Institute's financial handbook. And in that handbook, there are examples of like... Um, you know, a loan equipment release form, um, tracking forms for your inventory and things like that. So there's some good examples in that handbook if you um, go to the website and download that. So moving on, and we're moving kind of quickly because we have a lot of information to cover today and, and not a whole lot of time. Um, you know, we're just talking more about budgetary considerations, managing your budget, um, things that are regularly, you know, your director, if you're a program director, um, you know, these are things that take your attention. You really need to, to talk about these things and decide how you're going to be tracking them. Um, in addition to your expenditures and your drawdown reports from your uh, finance office, um, you know, your cuff account. There's other things that the director keeps track of, you know, these what we call reportables um, and requests for budget modifications and things like that. And I do want to mention that if you do need to make a budget modification, you're going to have to have a conversation with your project officer and make sure that you discuss with them what these budget modifications are and why it's necessary. So when you're reconciling your financial reports within the cuff account, you know, we recommend, and again, I want to say that everything that we're talking about today are recommendations. Uh, everyone does things differently. Um, this is not mandatory, but we feel like that this is the best practice for managing your budget. 
So, you know, sometimes we'll get an email later. Well, you said that we have to, and it's not like that. We're just trying to help you. And so we're just trying to give you good um, information from individuals that have a lot of experience in budget management. So um, hopefully no one will email later and said, well, you told us to do this, that, and the other, and we didn't. <laughs> But what we're saying is that it's a good practice that, you know, at least once every quarter um, that you run these expenditure reports from your finance office. I'm going to say more than that, honestly. I feel like you should be doing it minimum monthly, but um, some people do things differently on their end. But this helps, you know, identify and know where you are with your budget. And it also helps like when questions come up, if there's not been a long amount of time between the expenditure and then when you're having a question about that expenditure, a lot of times you'll catch things early. You know, maybe it wasn't the correct line item expenditure and you need to move that, you know, to another line item. And these are things that um, I'm sure, Kim, you probably could talk a little more on this. Yeah, I could probably talk all day about it, but... <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I definitely would recommend monthly, especially um, from July, August, and September, because we, as we know, September 30th is the end of the of the grant period, and that's when you need to especially make sure that all your expenditures are accurate and they're in the right place, and if you think feel like you need to make, you know, some extra, maybe you didn't buy your computers that you had budgeted, you need to go ahead and get that done, so yeah, I would definitely, and, and it, definitely have a good rapport with your finance office. I know we haven't mentioned that yet, but you you definitely need to have that because that way you can get with that person if you find something that's, you know, out of the ordinary or went to the wrong account or you don't understand something, uh, definitely have that relationship. But yeah, and I also wanted to mention that when we talk about doing budget modifications, I know there's an instance of one grantee that actually did receive additional money. Um, so that is, a, is an option. I don't think it's very um, done very often, but there is an option that if you have something catastrophic happen within your tribe or, you know, such as a large layoff or something like that, and you feel like you're just not going to be able to you know, or you have extra people that you need to serve, please reach out and ask them because I do know that they have uh, awarded people extra funds. But we also, you also, if you have to do any kind of major budget, budget modification, please reach out to them because they do have to approve that. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, we can't stress enough how important it is to reach out to your project officer right. um, and have that relationship with them where you can ask questions requests, like Kim said. And so moving on, some more budgetary considerations. Um, oh, wait a minute. I think we had a, a poll. Do we have a poll coming up, Miles? Sorry, I got on the wrong screen there. Poll three coming up. <laughs> so I think we just talked about this a few minutes ago. What is a drawdown? Is it a gradual decrease in the amount of money that you spend? Is it done, you know, on a specific timeline? Um, do you think it helps decrease your chance of losing your funding or all of the above? Yeah, we got 100% answers on this, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> That was kind of a gimme. <laughs> but yeah, we just wanted to say that, you know, drawdown is so important to your budget. Um, and these are different things that you need to consider um, in your drawdown. You know, it's going to be a gradual thing. You're not going to draw down half of your budget all at one time. Because um, when you start dealing with those bigger amounts of funds, you know, there's it's likely to give you um, some problems. So doing that gradually is always a good practice. Um, doing it uh, on a timeline is a good practice. And also, you know, using these general practices help you decrease, you know, the opportunity for an error or a mistake. Thanks, 
Miles. Moving on, let's talk more about um, strategic planning. Um, basically, you know, that's just budget projections. Um, you want to make sure that you have a plan each year uh, when you're developing your year's budget um, for the next year. You know, kind of look at your current year's budget and how did you expend money? How did you spend your money? You know, do you think you're going to have similar costs in the coming year? So having a budget projection really helps you kind of see down the road. And that's also going to help you with your drawdowns. Um, also, a little bit about excessive balances. Um, this information did come directly from our essay, the definition of it. Um, and they are wanting you to report this information in your APR. So make sure if you have excessive balances, you know, this is something that you really need to have a discussion with your project officer about. We also want to mention uh, internal controls. Um, so having these budget or these financial tracking systems in place, it's going to improve your accountability for your budget funds. It's also going to help um, achieve your project's goals and objectives, um, your performance and your target budgets, also improving the reliability of your financial reporting. So if you have financial tracking in place, when you do do your APR or any of your financial reporting, you have documentation to back that up. Um, and it helps you improve compliance and also it helps you in gaining uh, public trust with your community because you have these systems in place and you are able to show in your reports exactly where the activities happened in your budget. Um, Jamie, we have one one more poll. Jamie, this is Emma. Could you go back one slide and give me just one second to finish writing this down? Sure. Did you get the um, email, Emma, with this presentation? I might have, um, my my husband's in the hospital, he had surgery, and so I'm having to do this uh, kind of remotely, so I'm so sorry, I haven't got I'm sorry, I am so sorry to hear that, Emma. Okay, thank you, I got it. Oh, you're welcome, and just send me an email if you need to um, afterwards, and I'll, I'll be glad to send you anything you, you need, okay? All right, we're going to talk about... Poll number four, it's already up. So, <laughs> yeah, everyone's pretty much on it. Well, are reasonable, allocable, and allowable costs the same thing? Yes or no? Oh, we kind of have a half and half, half think that it is and half think that it's not. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you that I feel like it's not. And I think that uh, when we say this is language that comes from the CFR, so, you know, it's always open to interpretation. But personally, I feel like that, no, these are not the same. And let's go ahead and talk about those definitions of what those cost principles are. So this comes directly from the federal regula regulations and the established guidelines or what we call the cost principles for determining costs um, that are applicable to your awards. So reasonable cost is reasonable if in nature and amount, it does not exceed that which would be incurred by, <laughs> it says in the, in the OMB, a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time the decision was made to incur the cost. So you could actually go to 200.404 and actually read that. So basically, um, 
to determine if an expenditure is reasonable, you kind of got to ask yourself these questions. You know, is the cost recognized? Is it necessary? Uh, you know, an ordinary cost for the performance of the grant. Um, have the individuals incurring this cost acted with due prudence? So that means good discretion or what we call common sense, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in those particular circumstances, and were the actions that were taken in respect to incurring the cost consistent with what your established policies and practices are for your grant? So that's the definition for reasonable. Anybody want to give an example of a reasonable cost? You can put it in the chat. All right, we got a volunteer. Oh, we got a couple of volunteers. Tires, yep. Uniforms, yep. I was thinking, you know, supplies, general things that you have to purchase, those are considered reasonable costs. So the next definition is allocable costs. Um, so they're treated consistently with other costs incurred for the same purposes in like circumstances and benefiting the award. So it says that a cost is allocable to a particular award if the goods and services involved can be directly assigned to the award based on the benefit provided. That's a bunch of government wording there. Basically what we're saying is, did that cost advance the work under the award? Um, did it benefit the award and other activities? Uh, did the basis for allocating, allocating the cost represent a reasonable estimation of the direct benefit, and if a cost is to be allocated to more than one award, how is that cost allocated? So these are things that are considered allocable. Trisha, you said not the most expensive, but not the cheapest either. <laughs> I like that description, Trisha. <laughs> Does anyone else want to Give us a, a, an example of what they think allocable means. I like Trisha's description. <laughs> and then, of course, the final is what we call allowable. So that's a cost within the year award limitations that's consistent, documented, reasonable, and allocable, again, from the OMB 200.403. Um, and so it says there that you use the term allowable to mean permitted as a cost within your general federal regulations and the terms of a specific award or your institution's indirect cost rate. So costs, you know, that are unallowable or mutually agreed upon to be unallowable should be identified. So you really need to identify in your um, budget exactly what those different costs are and what's considered reasonable, what's considered allocable. And I know that probably all sounds very confusion. It is. <laughs> but we did want to mention it. Um, Kim, would you like to talk a little bit about payment for services, why it's important to have policies? Uh, yeah. Um written policies to govern the rates of payment for all purchase VR services. You can establish a fee schedule and design to ensure that your agency pays a reasonable cost for each service as long as the fee schedule is not so low as effectively to deny an individual a necessary service and permits exceptions so the individual needs can be addressed. Um, the TVR agency may not place absolute dollar limits on the amount it will pay for specific service categories or on the total services provided to an individual. Um, this is where I think that some things are also allowed under a, on a case by case basis, because if I want to buy tires for somebody, as somebody just mentioned, and I want to spend $400 and then somebody else comes in and they have a truck 
and their tires are going to be $600, then I can't say, no, I'm only going to pay 400 because that's what I've decided. That's how much tires cost. So you, it's, that's where you have to have an exception um, for, for each individual person. But you can say, I'm only going to pay $500 for a computer, and then that's how much you, you try to stick to that. And um, so you just have to work with the IPEs and the individuals to determine what they need and how necessary that it is for what they may be asking for. And then you determine within your program, I mean, uh, you can ask Amanda, stuff in Alaska costs three times what it costs in, in North Carolina. So you, you just have to, you know, use common sense and but do what's the best, the best thing you can do for your consumer to, to make sure they meet their goal. That's correct. And so also we need to take into consideration not only payment for services and have policies in place about rates that you're willing to pay, things like that, but also um, the duration of services. So you need to have like some reasonable guidelines, you know, time period for your provision of services. Um, and those are so that they're not so short that you kind of deny folks necessary services and and um, needed things. But also, you know, this allows you to permit some exceptions, just like uh, Kim was saying just now, you know, a set of tires for, you know, a 1999 Toyota might be a little less expensive than a set of tires for a 2020, you know, Chevy pickup. So you do have to have those exceptions. Um, and especially in the duration of services, we all know that some cases take a lot longer than others, you know, but you do need to have some parameters that you um, are actually working in. So, you know, we shouldn't be placing, you know, time limits on the provision of services um, or specific services to an individual. Um, the duration of each of these services um, is determined basically on that individual's needs. So, you know, it's not cookie cutter. All IPE expenses are not the same. And there is some room for movement in that IPA, IPE in um, direct relation to the duration of the services and the expenditures for the consumer costs. And then thirdly, we want to talk about authorization authorization of services. Um, you know, you have to make sure that you establish policies um, about, you know, the timely authorization of services. You some projects may have policies in place where the director has to sign off on all services. Some projects may have policies in place where if you spend a certain amount of money, then you have to have authorization from either the director or someone from the finance office. So depending on your project's needs, um, and Kim, you could probably describe a little bit about authorization. Just exactly what you said. Um, it's based on the amount of, uh, you know, we, we have a threshold of expenditures and then, um, you know, this policies and procedures that relate to that. Okay. I just realized we had some messages in the chat box <laughs> and I wanted to go back and look at some of those. Um, Megan. Yeah, that's interesting, Megan. You want to talk about that a little bit about what's going on in your community? Okay, so our tribe actually, um, we were overspent for our tribe, like on the donation, for donations to community members. We have a lot of homelessness going on and a really bad drug problem within our community. So what they were requiring in order for them to get any type of assistance, they were requiring them to sign up for Voc Rehab to see if we could help them first. So as a result, um, our numbers, we had like over 300 people sign up for our program and our grant um, specifically states like 115 people will be served during the fiscal year. So 
we definitely had to make an, we had to eliminate something going into our last year to make sure that we would be able to still help all of these people without hopefully not going on into like a waiting list situation. We didn't want to do that. So we decided to eliminate vehicle repair. We did a policy on it and I just wanted to make sure that there's nothing out there saying that I'm doing something against regulations or anything by doing that. Do you want to answer that, Kim? Um, I think. I would, uh, uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say uh, quickly. Uh, I think the key, Megan, is that you have reasonable reasons for creating these particular um, policies. Or you right now are not able to cover these costs. And I think any time that you have documentation and you have reasonable reasons for operating the way that you are, then you're going to be okay when you discuss this with your project officer. Okay. Should I have informed her about the situation before eliminating it as a service? So um, I think I think we need to, to have a, a, a deeper dive into what all of this surrounds um so megan if, if we can talk later and then we can yeah. share that information out that uh, would be great because I, I want to keep i want to keep these guys going on on track okay. with the, the the setup services but if, you, if you'll reach out to me later then you and i can have a conversation about it that would be great thank you thanks so much for that question megan um, and Amanda also says, you know, costs are even higher in the villages in Alaska. So Nome, Bethel, Dillingham, Arctic Slope, Birch Creek, Juneau, and Buckland. These areas, um, I think, Amanda, you're saying, you know, there are reasonable or allocable um, reasons behind the additional costs in these expenditures. And you're exactly right. And then documenting that and making sure you convey that in your annual reports is a good way to let people know, hey, it costs three times more to probably even more than that to buy tires uh, in Nome than it does in the lower 48. Um, and Tricia also says costs like rent and fuel are outrageous in San Diego. I can't imagine, um, Trish, what those costs are like out there. I know the last time I was there, I, I just about fell out when I had to stop and buy some gas. <laughs> yeah. um, and Amanda says that RSA is working on a checklist so we can all know exactly what is needed to purchase a service equipment over 5000 Thanks, Amanda, for sharing that with us. Um, Janine, thanks for the training. Oh, y'all have to go to another meeting. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and thank you too, Pat. So we wanted to get on to um, a Q&A session. So let's just recap. We kind of rushed through what we presented today. We just kind of broached each one of those topics, but we wanted you to be aware that these are things that you need to be considering when you are managing your budget or setting up your budget or setting up your financial tracking for your budget. So a real quick recap, when you're initially establishing your budget um, from your grant documents, you need to make sure and review that budget that was in your proposal, look at your match, look at your indirect cost, Go ahead and come up with a system of accounting to keep up with your funds. Um, and then also, if you have any budget modifications and reviews, make sure you reach out to your project officer. Also, in the setting up of your financial tracking, you want to make sure that you're receiving the reports from your tribe's accounting department, that you're also utilizing CUF accounts within your program um, on a program level. Um, and that you have that confidentiality code system for your participant's name so you can track spending um, and then also your inventory management. And then on the budgetary considerations, also make sure that you're reconciling with those financial reports uh, that come from your tribal accounting department against your CUF account. 
So you're making sure that the expenditures you're tracking are also being tracked on the um, accounting department's level. Budget modifications, again, um, run those before you uh, run into any issues. You need to make sure and have a conversation with your project officer. And then planning your budget, having budget um, planning, you know, strategic planning for your budget is very important every year. I think it's very important you have a budget projection already created um, for your coming year's budget. And then also, again, excessive balances. Those are things you have to have a conversation with your project officer about. Um, we've got some questions. Amanda said, our hubs and smaller villages freight to send the equipment is even more. And gas is $9 a gallon and that she forwarded that info to their 121 listserv, and she's hoping everybody's on that listserv. Um, and she said what she had to do in August is that September, they approved two purchases for $22,000 total. Wow, that's a lot. Amanda, y'all deal with a lot up there. So now I want to open it up. We have Kim with us today. And there's some other project directors on here well, as well with a lot of experience. And for you new project directors, um, now's the time. Let's have a, a Q&A session. We have probably about 15 minutes left where we can actually talk about some specific uh, scenarios and questions you may have. Does anybody have any questions about their budget? Uh, who's, I think, Tricia, you said you guys are preparing to submit a budget proposal. Is that right? I mean, a um, grant proposal. Is that right? Did Tricia leave us? Mickey, where are you located? I just saw your name in the chat. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your program? Hello, my name is Mickey Naranjo. I'm the Contracts and Grants Manager here at the Southern Ute Tribe. For the Southern Ute Tribe, I work with Bobby Rosa, who is the... Um, director or you know the lead program manager for our work we have and so what I do is I just uh, uh, manage the grant and work and assist do the drawdowns you know submit the 425s I'm just more or less the um, management side of it oh okay yeah. so I'm is there any I remember too so you know I'm um, working in my position I take it very um, serious that you know we are um, thankful that our tribe receives this funding to offer the services to our to the community, to the Native American community, as well as our tribal members. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks for introducing yourself. You're I didn't welcome. mean to put you on the spot, but I just wanted to know which program you were with. Um, we have a question in the chat from Charlene. Uh, that says, if we need to move money around in our budget, at what point do we need to get approval from RSA? Kim, you want to answer that question? Um, I'm not the expert on that, but typically we uh, we do 10%. So if we can, we, if we need to move 10% from a line item, um, we, we, we do that. But we don't ever take any consumer money. We, we just use... We just move around admin money, and that's usually because we have salary savings. If we does, if somebody uh, hasn't worked or whatever, we haven't hired a position, we'll we'll move salary savings. But um, we we typically don't do a lot of that. But um, that's ten percent is what we use. Oh, okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have an example of um, if they had to make a budget modification? What did that look like? Can anyone share with us maybe one of our 
uh, more experienced directors that are on today could could give an example of a budget modification. Yeah. Okay, no one's had mo any budget modifications in the last couple of years. Nobody didn't want to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of figured that was the case, but we were wanting to be open and transparent. Um, <laughs> so and Keith said, uh, can you talk about consumer participation in the cost of services when they have been employed for a significant period of time, please? Keith, you want to tell us a little bit more what you're, do you mean like in post-employment services? No, um, we have a lot of situations where consumers will apply and they're either employed at the time of application or they become employed. Um, I can think of a specific case where a couple individually applied um, they were both working for the BIA and they were requesting assistance with tires, which roughly came up to around $1,500 per vehicle. Now, from my perspective, that, <clears throat> that's, that shouldn't have been allowed. They didn't have children in the house. It was just the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, both had significant income. But it seems to me that that's, that's a discussion that people try to stay away from is looking at the, whether or not the participant has a responsibility to participate in the cost of services. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kim, can you talk a little bit about that or Wayne? Well, I'd love to hear from either one of you about that. Let Wayne talk about that. I don't think we've had that. A situation like that. Keith, I am just uh, astounded. They both have uh, jobs and they're consumers in your program. No, there was, there's a lot going into why they were consumers. It wasn't something um, in the past, and this case was from the past, but in the past, we've had a lot of push from tribal leadership regarding um, what was allowable and what was not. And the reason we had that push was because um, the vice chairman had a discussion at one of the KNR events and what he came away, his understanding come away, coming away from KNR was that anything was allowable, basically if it was pencil whipped enough, if you used the right vernacular, if you worded it right, anything could be justifiable. And so he just kind of ran with that. And so anytime someone would come to the tribe, whether it was simply because it was an expense that they didn't want to pay for themselves, whether it had anything to do with their disability, whether it had anything to do with uh, maintaining employment because their employment was in jeopardy because of the disability, none of those things. Um, so um, I'm asking this question first to make sure that I'm not giving this information or that I'm not thinking about it incorrectly um, as I you know, continue to have some discussion similar to this. Well, I, I like how both of you guys bailed and dumped it on me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice right, that? <laughs> so here, here's how I understand it, is, is that you guys were uh, provided some information that was not 100% accurate. There is the old standard. Um, if you end a sentence with removes barriers to employment, it pretty much justifies all cost services for consumers. Um, that That's an old school train of thought. Right. And it's, it's it's a lot of what we still follow in, provide, in provision of services. Um, but the way that your or that... Um, that individual interpreted that meaning was that we we were we were to give them anything and everything and and make sure that we we could pay for all of the expenses and that's not accurate right um so it goes back to that is it disability connected does it remove an impediment to employment and it does it does it allow that barrier to be overcome and for that individual uh, to return to employment now 
um, in in the in the situation where you're bringing on a participant or a consumer who's already employed, and we are going underneath that that heading or umbrella of maintaining or advancing employment, then we then we look at what services are required to remove those barriers uh, for that person to stay involved in in that employment position. And I always <clears throat> encouraged my TVR counselors to um, always get an engagement or, or participation from the, the participant in some of the cost services. Sure. And when we looked at it, we never, it was always in the realm of, you know, does it create a hardship? If not, then okay, then they can participate. And if it does create a financial hardship, what can they, you know, like in that, that uh, cost sharing mode, uh, what, what can they provide? Can they provide right. their own transportation so we aren't paying for fuel? Anything to get buy-in from that, that participant or consumer. Sure. There's no hard and fast rule. Uh, in the regulations that state we have to have a 10% match or we have to have a, a, a 50% or 49.1% right. engagement. It's, it's just whatever that individual can participate and remain, you know, livable financially in their daily life. Um, so in, in the, the description that you gave of the situation you're dealing with, my first question is, you know, did we go back to the eligibility criteria and look at that before we start giving these guys money? Well, there's, there's, yeah, there's been a change in leadership, which of course we all go through that pretty routinely. We kind of have a standard song that we sing, if you will, every time leadership changes to try to explain what VR is and what our purpose is, what our goal is, that we are not a social service program. Um, but you're always going to, as you said before, you're going to run into that old school thinking that whatever it is the uh, the member needs, that's what you're supposed to get them. But my point in all of this is really to encourage other program directors and leaders to understand that at some point, the ultimate goal of everything we're doing is to establish self-sufficiency and independence not to buy tires every other year when a person comes back and go, oh, well, my tires are running out. I need new tires. And y'all, I hear you laughing, but that's that's real for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. You know, you become the catch-all. You become the backup, the financial backup for whatever it is that a person doesn't necessarily want to spend money on. And in that particular situation, you have a couple who are both working through the BIA, good positions, well-paying positions. They're not going to school. They don't have kids in the home. The disability is not about to cause them to lose their job. For me, there's no justification for providing that service. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on that one. Yeah, I agree too, Keith. Uh, you know, um, I know that we don't have um, need as far as financial need in the consideration of eligibility. But sometimes I feel like you need that. Yes. That's because if you, you know, if you can determine that these individuals have sufficient money, you know, and I like the way that Amanda addressed it in the chat. Um, she says that they don't require them to contribute to the cost, but they encourage it because um, they offer post-employment up to three years, but you know it's in a case-by-case -case basis. So if they have, both of them are working and have good paying jobs, then they should have the money saved up for emergency purchases. Um, and she said that it, in this situation, she would offer consumer financial planning information. <laughs> sure, and that's, I like that's that. very real. I think, I think that, that most consumers need that because I've even seen situations where a consumer would come in with multiple diagnoses, but none of them were acting as an impediment. None of them were causing distress on the job or have to lose the job or that for whatever reason they needed to change jobs, which would all be viable. Um, yeah. But they were four months behind in house payments, four months behind in car payments, 
Yeah, well, that's the problem. Insurance payments, but they're driving a new car. Yeah. There's something wrong with that. Sammy, I just have a comment. Yes. Um, I know of a tribe that did that. They decided that everybody that needed hearing aids within the whole tribe, whether they had, you know, even senior citizens, they sent them to the VR program to get hearing aids. And the VR program paid for that because they felt like they were in a forced situation. Right. And after that got back to RSA, they lost their grant. Yes, ma'am. So just be that, I mean, document, document, document if you're being told to do that because sure. then it's not on you, it's on the person above you that's that's telling you to do that. All right, and I'm glad, I'm so glad you brought that up because again, that's my point is just to have, especially new directors on here, you know, at some point or another, there are some of us who have really great leadership in the tribe and some still have to struggle and fight that fight every time leadership changes. Mm -hmm. But it's good to understand that there are some situations that may be impressed upon you uh, and there are ways to deal with that, not just accept it and go, well, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Kim, I appreciate you always reiterating the documentation aspect, but also helping people understand that, you know, case by case is really case by case. Really look at it and see if, you know, should have they should they have been eligible in the first place? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, no, I've enjoyed please. this discussion. I knew when you started out with a tribal council member <laughs> and been to Kanar, <laughs> yeah. there was going to be some trouble. <laughs> so thank you so much for, um, and thanks, Amanda, for sharing uh, how you handle those situations. I just want to go back to the chat real quick. Um, people did finally comment and say that they did do some budget modifications. Um, and... Megan said that way back in the day, we were told that we don't need permission if you're just moving uh, funds in the program from one service line to the other service line. So kind of like what Kim said earlier, if it's not participant money. Um, we are out of time. I wanted to ask everyone, uh, Miles, are you going to put the survey in the chat, the link to the survey? Okay. Well, we have an end of webinar survey. We would certainly appreciate your feedback. It helps us uh, when we're developing uh, training materials and information. Um, it really helps us to decide, you know, how we could make our presentations better if we can. Um, and we always appreciate your input and thank you for being honest with us. Um, I also wanted you to see these resources links. We talked about the financial toolkit from the TVR Institute. Um, you can go to either directly to their uh, website and go to the course information. It's a module system that you can go through each section of that financial toolkit. Uh, you can also reach that on our website, avertac.org. Um, and also the TVR Institute's handbook is available. Um, there's lots of good resources on their website as well as ours. So just wanted to make sure you had those links um, when it came to the actual financial toolkit. And I just want to thank Kim Lambert for joining us today. I appreciate your time, Kim. I know everyone else does too. And uh, we thank appreciate you your, <laughs> your experience and, and your um, years as a director. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. And thank you for everyone that had questions. That's how we learn when we talk about it and discuss it with each other. So thanks again. And I hope you have a great day. Hey, Jamie, quick question. Yes. Um, you think we can have these uh, more on the grant topics more often for all of us directors so we can actually kind of, you know, when we do have questions that come up, because I swear every, every other week we got different questions on something. Yeah, sure. And also, you know, um, Laura uh, Maldsey with the Institute, she holds that uh, director's um, talking circle every other week. Yep. So that's a good place, too, to kind of get in a room with everybody and kind of hash some things out. Say, say again. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, are you able to or could, could you send us the... Um... The, the document that uh, this presentation is uh, based on? 
Yes, sure. Um, Burdette, do you have my email address? Jamie, um, I, a, I put yeah, it in the chat. Here. Yep, let's write it down. Go, Go write it down. Okay, just make sure. Okay. okay. It's Jamie, J A M I E dot Emmanuel, E M A N U E L at NAU dot EDU. And uh, you can go to our website too. All of our email addresses are listed there as well and our phone numbers. But okay. yeah, I'll be glad to send it over okay. to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Hope everyone has a great day.